It's day three of the great Canadian book debate. We started with five great titles, all with the power to shift your perspective. We've said goodbye to two so far. Three books are still in the running. Which one will be the next to go? We'll find out today. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads. This is Canada Reads, Canada's annual title fight. Hello and welcome back. I'm sitting at the Canada Reads table, joined once again by this year's panel. To my left is Jeopardy super champion Matea Roach. Hello, Matea. Hi. Next to Matea is educator and dancer Gudeep Pandere. Hello, Gudeep. Hello. Next to Gudeep and across from me at the Canada Reads table, actor and director Keegan Connor Tracy. Hello, Keegan. Hello. And next to Keegan is social media star Tasneem Gidi. Hello, Tasneem. Hi. And finally, sitting on my right is actor and choreographer, Michael Gray. I say hello, Michael. Hello, good morning. Before we get started, let's reflect on yesterday's debate. Day two, I would say, had passion, it had emotion, it had thoughtful discussion. And at the end of the day, Greenwood by Michael Christie was the second book to be eliminated from Canada Reads. Keegan, you were championing that book. How are you feeling today? Um, you know, I have lots of mixed feelings, as I'm sure everybody who answers this question has. Um, Nobody wants to go home ever. Um, and I, but I really believe in this book and I have a lot to say about it still and um, you'll all hear it. <laughs> well, I'd like to give you a, a few minutes right now before we move on. I wanted to give you a chance to remind everyone why they should read Greenwood, why all of Canada should read this book. Okay, well, first of all, I wanna say thank you to everybody at Canada Reads. This was like, the fact that we have a national annual discussion about literature is such a victory in this time of screens. And I'm so pleased to be part of it. I love to talk about books and that's obvious. And so it was wonderful to get to do it. Mm. Um, in terms of, when, you know, when this was brought to me, it was, what is one book that everyone in Canada should read? And when I, ch I chose that before I knew like the, the shift your perspective, I still stand by that I think this book is something that everybody across this country can read and relate to in some fashion. We all have families, we all live in this country, we share it, we share its history. Um, this book has already found so many people. Uh, I think book clubs are gonna love it. It is at the number one on the CBC paperback bestseller list this week and it has been for six weeks. People know this book, people love this book, people will continue to love this book. Um, I think that says a lot. I, I can see it, like as a director, I can really see it. I hope it finds a life on the screen. Um, I think it's like uh, Yellowstone, but in the forest meets succession. I think that's how I would pitch it. Uh, I hope I get an episode if it exists. Um, and I just wanna say like, I do think it shifts perspective. I think if you read this book and you don't think about the natural resources of this country and especially like the very long of this country and how vulnerable they are. And if we think that 2038 is far off in the future where we'll all be dead, it's not true. It is out there, it's 25 years away. It's when our children will be coming of age. And we should think about how we deal with that in this country, our natural, natural resources and, and how we take care of them. And also I think it, it gives you a perspective on your family. If you read it and you don't think about either the difficult relationships you have with someone or somebody who you love desperately, if it doesn't call that to mind, I think you've missed the point. Um, and so again, I say like book clubs, I think are gonna love this and it's going to really spark a lot of discussion. Thank you, Keegan. And off the top, you mentioned nobody likes to go home. Just a reminder that you're not going home. I didn't go home. We know I did. Not, we'd imagine. We'd like like what if there was just like an a... empty chair one day? No, somebody was like, she didn't go. Home. I don't you're, know. <laughs> a, you're a free agent and we, uh, we look forward to uh, watching how that's uh, balanced out on this table. All right, let's get to it. There are three books still on the table. We're going to play the trailers for each of them and the panelists championing that title will get 60 seconds to make their opening argument. After that, we'll debate, and at the end of the show, one book will be eliminated. So we've talked about why all of Canada should read these books. We've talked about how they can shift a reader's perspective, and now we want to get personal. So today's opening question is, why did you choose the book that you are championing on Canada Reads? We're going to go clockwise around the table. Matea, Matea, that means you are up first. You are championing the graphic memoir, Ducks, by Kate Beaton. Here's the trailer. Meet Katie Beaton. She's 21 years old. She wants to be a cartoonist. She's fresh out of school and saddled with debt. Reluctant to leave behind her close-knit seaside community for life in the unforgiving oil sands, where bulldozers are the size of buildings. The attention and harassment are constant. It's hard and lonely work that 
can change people for the worse. And the destruction of the environment and the local communities is just at the cost of doing business. To survive, she forms bonds, finds hope, camaraderie, and solidarity with a trusted few. Just like ducks, we migrate, seeking greener pastures, bluer skies, and the promise of a better life. Matea, 60 seconds are on the clock. Why did you choose Ducks for Canada Reads? So Ducks is a memoir, which means it's a very specific story, but it's also a story that I think every person who is from the Maritimes can relate to. Um, I have never worked in the oil sands. My sort of student debt crisis choices were very different than the ones that Kate made. Um, but my family has history of displacement. Um, at the beginning of the book, Kate says, uh, as a person from Cape Breton, you can either have opportunity or you can have home you can't have both. I've had the experience of moving away from Nova Scotia. I came to Toronto when I was 16 and it was incredibly difficult. And I really related to the way that Kate talks about the difficulty of moving away. Uh, my mom's grandfather worked in the Great Lakes. You know, Kate mentions that there's a long history of people moving away from Cape Breton to the Boston states, to Ontario, to Alberta. Uh, my dad's dad worked uh, on trains going to and from the coal mines in New Waterford, a town that actually gets name checked in this book. I think that there is so much here that relates to my family history that is generational to everyone that I know from back home, and I'm so proud to be championing this book. Thank you, Matea. All right, Gurdip, you're next. You're championing the novel Hotline by Dimitri Nasrella. Let's play the trailer. The year, 1986. My name, Muna Haddad. Leaving behind a civil war in Lebanon, I fled with my son, Omar. I lost my family. I lost my husband. I came to Montréal in winter. The weather is cold. Our prospects are colder. We are alone. Omar isn't fitting in at school. I am living paycheck to paycheck. One day I find a job. I'm a hotline operator for a weight loss center. Over the phone, my clients have everything to lose. Yet I have something to offer. I talk, I listen, I hear their secrets. I earn their trust. Montréal is a bit warmer now, as are we. Our story in Canada has just begun. We're deep 60 seconds are on the clock. Why did you choose to champion Hotline on Canada Reads? Hotline speaks to me in numerous ways. Protagonist Mona and I faced the similar barriers. Like her, I immigrated to this country. She applied to many jobs, but she was denied repeatedly. I applied for many jobs too. I was denied many times repeatedly. Once based on my skills in my resume without seeing my face, an employer offered me a job. When I went to work, very first day after seeing my face, they asked me to find job somewhere else. So I know about barriers and pain. I rarely talk about my own story. Despite what I faced, I make happy videos and talk about positivity to make people smile. In Hotline, Mona, as a weight loss consultant, does the same. She makes Canadians feel better. I want people across Canada to shift their perspective on racism and acknowledge their existence. Thank you, Gurdip. All right, the final book is the novel Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Michael, you chose this book for Canada Reads. Let's check out the trailer. Toronto, a production of King Lear. On stage, the star has a heart attack. A paramedic tries to save his life. An eight-year-old actress sees it all unfold. Meanwhile, the Georgia flu spreads around the world. A pandemic and with it, panic, chaos, and death. 20 years later, the little girl, Kirsten, is fully grown. She's in a troupe of actors and musicians who travel across the Great Lakes. She doesn't remember much from before, but she remembers Arthur, King Lear that night. She still has the comic books he gave her. They hold the key to remember what was lost and 
to find our way forward. Michael, you have 60 seconds. Why did you choose Station Eleven to champion on Canada Reads? Apocalyptic novels have always captivated me, and I've had to ask myself why. I mean, there's intellectual reasons. Uh, indigenous people have already survived an apocalypse, colonialism. So dystopias are familiar territory. But on a more personal level, I think I'm afraid for our world, our communities. And what this book does at every single moment is it turns away from despair and chooses grace. You know, at the beginning of the novel, uh, the play that's being performed is Lear with its themes of uh, betrayal, regret, and death. And 20 years after the end of the world, they choose to perform a Midsummer Night's Dream that explores love and magic and transformation. Station Eleven chooses love over death, um, belonging over membership. Thank you, Michael. There you have it. The three titles still in the running for Canada Reads. They are Ducks by Kate Beaton, championed by Matea Roach, Hotline by Dimitri Nasrallah, backed by Gurdip Pander, and Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, chosen by Michael Gray Eyes. We've just heard their opening arguments. Now it's time to debate. The three remaining books examine the impact of being disconnected from family and community. Which title helped you best understand how it feels to be isolated and alone? Keegan, let me ask you first. <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> Is it just because I'm across from you? Um, I think I, I felt that in all of them, certainly. Uh, there is a bleak loneliness to ducks uh, and being part of a, a really male-dominated profession. I, I think I understand that. There are many more women now than there were when I, st when I started. You never saw a woman on a set. Uh, I understand and I empathize with the, those male-dominated uh, environments. I, my mother-in-law comes from the Philippines. I, it, it has caused me to ask a lot of things about the things I took for granted as a Canadian who was born here. Uh, and I really think that that book will will shift what people think about what that experience is like. I think it's so easy for people who don't have a broad world view to judge someone based on the color of their skin, for example, without understanding, like trying to explain, these are people who have escaped war. You just, you know, you can't get your Tim Hortons in time in the morning. I, I think it offers perspective on how lucky we are to live in this country and the problems we have. Um, I, I felt it less so, it, although I'm so persuaded by the way you speak so eloquently always. Um, but I still, I loved that, and I know that I would have been part of the traveling, you know, the traveling uh, symphony. Why can't I think of what it's called? I, I love that about. Of course, I do. I, I, I absolutely believe in the power of art, especially in times when they're so grim like this. I, I did struggle with how it was dark, but I, I, I appreciated that what they were was a light in the darkness. And um, wow, can we not all use that right now? And just for our radio audience, I'll let people know that when you said I struggled a little bit, you were referring Michael's to uh, Station Eleven, yes, Michael's you. book. Tasneem, let me ask you to weigh in on this. Yeah, I actually really, I didn't have time to commend Ducks yesterday, and I really wish that I did, because I think, I don't know if it was a financial decision or if it was an intentional choice on Kate's, but I love the color tone in the book. I think it did such a good job to really depict Kate's emotions while going through, and I loved it so much. One thing that I will say, though, sometimes it was, like a lot of what people were saying yesterday was, um, the way how with the characters, there's too many characters for them to relate to. I felt like it was sort of the same thing with the pacing with the, the scenes cutting with each other. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's also a thing about graphic memoirs, but while I was going through it, I didn't know if there were pages missing or if we were just going to another scene. And again, a lot like what Michael was saying on day one, it was to really immerse in Kate's experience and actually living there and how the days kind of blended into one another and it was just either you're working or you're not. And I did appreciate that, but sometimes it did take me out of the book to appreciate it. But I think the color tone of the palette was color tone of like the panels were beautifully done. And I think did a really good job at you know depicting Katie's emotions, but it did do so kind of at a cost. Mm -hmm. Matei, do you have a reaction to that? Yeah, I think when you mentioned like it actually is almost a deliberate choice, I think mm -hmm. of like the way that the days blur into one another. I think like there's even direct mention, right? Of when she first moves to the oil sands, she's talking about how she's having such a difficulty adjusting between the day shift and the night shift because she's not even consistently working at the same time of day. So there's that sense of dysregulation. And I think that that's almost maybe more a feature than it is a problem, although I understand 
understand how perhaps it can take you as a reader uh, maybe a bit of adjustment there. I think in terms of the characters, because I know that's something that's also come up, is like the characters blend together somewhat. I think that's also somewhat deliberate in the sense of I think we've probably all had jobs where we feel kind of like an island and then there's just this swarm of people around us and we don't necessarily, especially like 15 years on or whatever it is that she's writing this book, remember exactly like details, right? There are some people that show up that just talk to her one time in the tool crib. She may not remember the name of that person, but she re may remember like something weird that they said to her. And so so that's like kind of what's represented. So I think that sense of disorientation actually is a big part of what this memoir is about and trying to articulate. But what do you say to people, though, who when, you know, if I'm saying and, and as a, a, a real, you know, I've read a lot of different mm -hmm. kinds of books, though not necessarily these, where I was constantly having to flip back. Like, mm -hmm. how, how are you going to sell that to people that that's easy for, you know, I think about my father-in-law mm -hmm. or my mother-in-law uh, mm -hmm. or, or just like a, there's a certain echelon that I think mm -hmm. are really going to struggle with that. Mm -hmm. So here's what I'll say about this. I think the way, at least for me, that I read graphic novels is somewhat different than the way that I read a prose book. And I think that, again, this is a feature of the form and not a problem, but may require some adjustment. So when I read a graphic novel, I do tend to read it faster than I would read a prose book, but what I also will do is typically read it more than once. Yes. Because I think especially when there's so much imagery, I'm often reading for text first and then I'll read something again for imagery. So Ducks is a book and like Fun Home that I've talked about before outside of this is like, you know, all of these graphic novels that have really shaped me, I will go back to them multiple times and discover new things each time. So I think for me, I didn't find myself needing to flip back and forth to remember characters. There were a couple that were really iconic, um, you know, Kate's sister Sister Becky that shows up, her friend Lindsay that she went to school with, like these are characters that are super recognizable. For the ones that are more kind of background and only show up a little bit, I thought to myself, when I go back, you know, I'll be able to get even more out of this person than these interactions, if that makes sense. But if we haven't heard from you yet, let's get you in on this conversation. Uh, do I need to talk about my books or other books? Your book is clearly connected to disconnection, uh, and, and you can talk about that, but you can also talk about what you've heard at this table. Great. Um, like Keegan said, all books, they have this element of isolation and loneliness. Uh, I think this is the valuable part of human nature. Um, in terms of Ducks and Station Eleven, I found this element in both of the books. Uh, in Ducks, uh, um, the moment of vulnerability, isolation she's going through in Fort McMurray and other, those other areas, and when people are saying those kind of words uh, to her, and the pain it was causing, uh, and the financial struggles. Uh, um, and when she approaches her employer uh, for some uh, clarification, and employer shuts her down, and she had to go through a lots and lots of vulnerable moments. In a similar way, Station Eleven too, all the characters, especially Kirsten, she's uh, going through a lot of vulnerability. Jeevan, like Jeevan, he's an important character in this, uh, in this book. Uh, my good friend was Jeevan in my primary school. Um, mm -hmm. He's going through s such a vulnerable Clark, uh, Miranda, C Carol. Oh my God, so much loneliness, so much isolation. Um, so many people lost so much, Al almost everything, almost everything, their, their, their family, their relatives. Uh, uh, and, and, and the Museum of Civilization is a perfect example of loneliness where uh, uh, Clark and his friends are collecting pieces from the lost world. Why they are collecting? Because they are feeling the loneliness and the isolation. So I, I found this, this element in both the books and in all, all of the books. Uh, and and is all uh, the authors, they did a great job. Let me leave the final word to you here, Michael. Um, you know, Isolation and loneliness, um, if we think about these books like music, you know, like I, when I, when I reread Ducks, it was like that was the key that it was written in, and that made it so beautiful to be immersed in it. Um, and then also with Hotline, you know, if that was the piece of music, when spring finally came, and it was like a key change, it was such a relief for me because I felt Muna's isolation so, so palpably. These are gorgeous books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is it for this round. <clears throat> that, uh, there was a little debate. It was mostly love. It was mostly love <laughs> in that round. We'll call that the love round. Um, for this second chunk here, we're going to talk about the fact that each of the books has a strong sense of place and setting. Mm. Right? They take us to a war-torn Lebanon in a cold winter in Montreal, Cape Breton in the Alberta oil sands, Toronto and a borderless world after civilization has, has collapsed. 
The question here is which book did the best job of transporting you to a different place? Tustine, let me start with you. Yeah, I was kind of talking about this yesterday, but um, I do love the fact that the book is nonlinear storytelling, and I think this book, out of all of them, has and really you were strong. Referring to sorry, Station Eleven, yeah. right? I apologize. That has maybe one of the strongest starts out of all the books that are here. But then, with the nonlinear storytelling, it was it was kind of hard, and also when the pacing kind of shifted when we left the pandemic, or sorry, the pandemic started, we kind of went to this little lull, and it was so hard for me to kind of picture where we were in relative to the story. And the fact that we kind of kept shifting between perspective to perspective, it was kind of hard for me to get a grasp of where I was and really have an emotional investment to the character, which kind of took me out of the book. Mm. Uh, but one thing that I will say, though, is Miranda's. I love the contrast between some of the scenes when we go to, like, destruction to... Am I allowed to say spoilers? I hope so. With Miranda oh, yeah. on the beach, I thought that was such a beautiful moment, and I felt like I was right there with her holding her hand. So I will say that. But with the whole shifting perspectives, like, so quickly that I didn't have a chance to really immerse myself into the story, it took me out. But Miranda's scene, wow. I dare say it called to mind Toronto really well in the beginning, and then it sort of disappeared into a place that could be anywhere yeah. and felt less like my first, you know, I was really thinking like Canadian book as I began this. And I was like, well, this doesn't feel Canadian to me. My second pass, I was like, and I said about how when I came in, I suddenly could see Jivan and, and at Frank's apartment overlooking the, um, the, the water and you could feel Toronto in it in a way that I really felt when I, when I drove in from the airport. Um, but I, I did feel like that sort of dissipated through the rest and, and perhaps that's intentional I, you know. yeah, I think these are really fair comments um, criticisms because setting in station 11 is not really the primary um, driver yeah. of, of action it's it's more character based uh, when I think about uh, Kate's illustrations in ducks the settings are so vivid right these like uh, snow-packed mud you know flats mm -hmm. um, I time traveled when I read Hotline, because her descriptive power of Montreal in that period was like, I was like, felt I was there. Um, so I think in those, both of those cases, setting is actually uh, a real place of home for where those novels sit. And, and I agree actually that that setting, you know, had a, uh, a place of importance, greater importance, I think, even though uh, Emily's uh, settings were truly poetic. Mm -hmm. Gurdip, let me ask you this question about setting and what, how do these books transport you and what, which book does a, a strong job of doing that? Uh, I would start uh, with Ducks. Um, great job, like, uh, putting those pictures. Um, you are just right there. You are just seeing those uh, scenes uh, near to the vision of author, like those those sketches, those those drawers and uh, and and machinery, those stars, flying ducks, uh, and everything, uh, you see that settings. And uh, and in Station Eleven, um, there there are multiple settings, but uh, uh, the author did a great job. Uh, like when you are at uh, at the production of King Lear, uh, you see the theater um, and uh, how the production is going, how the audience. Is is sitting other people there's a beautiful description of uh, uh, many many things um, and the same after a, a post apocalypse uh, um, all those settings are moving but i really like the setting of uh, uh, that that uh, airport uh, uh, which was turned into a civilization of museum and people were trying to connect with each each other way and and in, in a hotline setting is powerful uh, like, it pierced my heart, like, when I was uh, uh, reading about Muna, just uh, uh, going deep and deep into that couch in that setting in her apartment in Montreal. Why? Because she's feeling so vulnerable. She wanted to hide from the world because there's no one to support her, no parents, no siblings, no spouse, almost no nobody. Just she's uh, lying on some other people out of her family. Um, uh, so, so settings are great in, in, in all of the books. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I think that for me, setting is almost a, a character in many books, right? The place where a book is located, if it's really evoked well, can be almost an additional character in the book. I think that Hotline does that quite well, you know, with evoking Montreal. And I remember reading some place names. I was like, oh, Place Alexis Mihon, I've been there. Like, I know exactly where that is. 
Um, I think with Station Eleven, I struggled in the sections that took place in between towns during the sort of post-apocalyptic period. I felt that Toronto was well evoked. I felt that the airport and you know the town of Saint Deborah by the water, where they stop and encounter the Prophet for the first time, those felt easy for me to envision. I think in part, you know, the city of Toronto, being that I live here, particularly was easy. But the sections that take place in these sort of interstitial, you know, they're walking through the wilderness, maybe on like the remains of a road or something. I didn't feel like I could visualize it in a way that quite transported me there. So although the characterization was good, and as you say, it's perhaps more of a character driven story, I wasn't like visually, mentally moved in the same way that I was when I was maybe reading Hotline or when I was reading Ducks. I will say, you know, a graphic novel has a bit of an advantage in transporting you to a place in the sense that you are actually being shown it. But to give like, you know, full credit to the artistry that Kate does in this book, I think reading it again, one thing I was struck by was just like the total blackness of the sky in contrast to this like industrial landscape below when she's working at night and she's out just under this blanket of stars, but then there's like this intense just degradation and like grossness in the land. I think there's also a lot of contrasts that are struck, you know, when you drive a little bit outside of like the sort of tailings ponds areas and there's this one scene towards the beginning of the book where she's taken for a drive out to this like land that's basically been filled in and there's like buffalo roaming around <clears throat> very close to where you have just like this toxic like soup uh, of industrial like you know runoff essentially. I think that that setting is something that like I've never seen in my real life and this book was able to take me there and I think that that's the power of, of ducks specifically. I think she evoked um, Kate Breton really well too, mm -hmm. that where she has a flashback and she's sit standing on the beach and you sort of feel the longing of that place mm -hmm. in that moment. Mm -hmm. And also I really remember the, um, and it was a challenge of that and I kind of wish it had been in color, but I also really appreciated the Northern Lights in black and white. There was mm -hmm. a certain challenge to that that I, I appreciated. Yeah, I think Tasneem made the point of like some of the constraints that have to do with like cost of color versus black and white. I'm not sure. I know Drawn and Quarterly is a small publisher and that probably to some extent affects like publication decisions. But I think you're right, like the evocation in black and white is still, you know, it's almost stark in a very different way, right? Because it's the tone of the whole book. It's keeping it in line with that. Okay, we'll leave it there. That's it for this round. Canada Reads is a celebration of great books. It is also a great competition, and it is uh, a long and getting longer, uh, engaging two and a half days. We're not done yet. We do have some special words of encouragement to help you get to the finish line. So have a listen to this. Hello, Matea. This is Brian, your old debate coach. When I told you I was looking forward to the next chapter, I didn't expect you to take it literally. But you've found a way to put your skills to work defending something you enjoy, which is lovely. I look forward to your doing so, and you can be certain we'll be cheering you on again. Michael, it's your friend, Elamaya Tailfeathers. I know with your charm, your charisma, your wit, your passion, your heart, and your brilliant mind, you stand a big chance of winning this thing. And if you don't, just remember that you'll always be gooch to all the aunties. <laughs> <laughs> that is a major life achievement. Break a leg, wound a knee, you make us all proud. I uh, love you so much, brother. Take care. Hi, Gurdeep. Sandy Coleman here. You know, I thought your looming images on billboards in downtown Vancouver and Toronto were at pinnacle of your fame. And here you are, panelists on Canada Reads. You are proving a tough competitor, but with your daily cardio routine of dance, this shouldn't come as any big surprise. Just as you did with our audience on that first morning show interview, beguile your opponents with your sincerity, and then take them to the mat with your infectious giggle. Gurdeep, we're cheering you on from the territory. You can do this. <laughs> Those were the voices of Matea's high school debate coach, Brian Casey, Michael's friend and blood quantum, quantum close star, Elamaya Tailfeathers, and one of the first people to interview Gurdeep, former CBC radio host, Sandy Coleman. I'm Ali Hassan. This is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Let's get back to the debate. These three books introduce you to a wide range of richly drawn and complex characters. I'm going to ask you which character was the most compelling. Gurdeep, let's start with you. Uh, in Station Eleven, I had a lot of support for Jeevan Chaudhary. I mentioned about him 
earlier. Although, yes, the main character, Arthur Leander, he, the, he, he has most connections, almost with everyone. But the sporting role he play, he's playing, oh, oh my God, that's amazing. He's uh, supporting the kid, supporting other people, uh, doing such a wonderful, although yes, yes, his appearance is, uh, uh, is, uh, is not that much in, in, in the novel, uh, but as a character, I would say that doing great. And uh, may I talk more than one book? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Which character was the most compelling is the uh, question. Of, uh, of course, in Duck's uh, um, Kate, um, uh, her life story, um, writing a mo memoir, I would say that you'll have to f first uh, resolve your fears about uh, uh, exposing uh, that it can create some vulnerability. So I give her credit for uh, being vulnerable and uh, and letting the world know about her story, which is uh, so powerful, so important. Uh, and and uh, through through her story, we are learning a lot lot about uh, about her world, and which is very important learning for everyone. There's a, a, a career in diplomacy for you uh, somewhere, <laughs> in Gurdip. Your joy and positivity for all the books is on display. Michael, I want to ask you which character is, is the most compelling? Which book does it best? You know, I think um, I love each of the five main characters in Station Eleven, you know, um, beyond measure. Uh, I'm, I've learned truly to love uh, Clark um, Thompson. Uh, you know, yesterday I said he's adjacent to fame. You know, that Arthur sort of takes up all this air in the room. Um, and there's a line in Station Eleven where, you know, the world's falling apart and uh, someone says, the center isn't holding. And it's so terrifying, but that's what Clark does. And so by the end of the novel, he takes on this incredible role of, of holding space and holding order in the midst of chaos. So. He's my favorite character, um, but in those same words, you know, Katie's um, the complexity of of what she reveals is is profound to me, and and Muna is a character I'll, I'll never forget. Tasneem, let me get your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I loved what you said about um, Jeevan's character because I fell in love with him the minute I met him, and I was so sad because I felt like it was a little bit of waste of potential in his character growth throughout the story, especially with the pivotal role that he played in the beginning, and then you don't see him again for like a hundred some pages. It's like I need for him to come back, and then when I met him again, he was like, he's a completely different person, which granted, he lived through a pandemic, right? But I would have loved to see how he got to that point, and especially with the relation to, again, so sorry for the spoilers, but with relation to his brother's death, and how that impacted him. And they I really, really wish kind of gloss they kind of that, kind right? of gloss over that. And I could talk a whole hour about it. And I was so upset about that, especially because it's a speculative fiction book. And I could talk about like disability rap with that as well. And that also kind of annoyed me. But in respect to Jeevan, because we're talking about characters, I really would have loved to see him reflect, not even just reflect on his brother's death, but just how it impacted him. And also with Kirsten, I think it was such wasted potential to not have those two go through the story together. Because they met in the beginning. And it would have been so poetic for them going through at the end. But I understand that, you know, you got five characters, but then because of the multiple POVs, it was so hard again to invest myself into those characters because I really wanted to. And I loved, you know, the, the approach, I guess, but I think the, exe the execution of it fell flat in a couple places. But I think I'm just bitter because I love Jeevan, honestly. So <laughs> <laughs> just it for me, as you were saying, you wish that Kirsten and Jeevan had met at the end. They both had the experience of losing their sibling. Like that was yeah. actually an additional thing that binds them together. I think it's interesting, you know, we have two works left in the competition that really focus on one character, right? You know, Ducks being a memoir naturally is going to focus primarily on the person writing it. And then Hotline really is Muna's story. Um, Station Eleven, I, I like the multiple points of view. I found it very compelling, but I, I found that like, yeah, there were certain characters that would fall out of the narrative at certain points that I wanted to know more about. Jeevan was one of those characters. And then we had this thing, like I loved Clark's characterization. I think because he like, reminds me of what I imagine people that I went to school with might be like when they're older, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like the sort of disaffected management consultant and lawyer type <laughs> class. I think I'm gonna know a lot of those people in like 30 years. Um, but then he was like a little bit absent from the beginning of the story. So it was interesting, like we saw a sort of a shift in who the focus was on. And I might've preferred like a little bit of a more consistent distribution across the entire text. Um, I want to talk about characterization outside of just Kate's point of view for a brief moment, because I think there's something that's really important to talk about with Dex that I haven't gotten to say yet, which is that 
the character of like the type of person who goes to work in the oil sands, not any specific character, but the general sort of experience of having to go out there is something that I think is articulated really well. So I think that, you know, yesterday we talked a little bit about the concept of agency and like why people make the decision to go out there. I think that the tension of working in a space that's like deeply hostile to you but as a person who maybe is transformed by that space in a negative way, someone who you know struggles with mental health and addiction as a result of being out there, somebody who maybe becomes a person who is worse than you were at home and engages in actions that you wouldn't have done absent that isolation, I think that the characterization of that, even though it's not really done in relation to one specific person, that's sort of a guy, and it, it is mostly guys, is evoked really well, I think, in this book. And that's something that I think is like, was really perspective shifting for me since it's an experience that's so different than my own life. And so that's something I really appreciate. Keegan, let me ask you, which uh, which book has the most compelling characters? Which, who does a good job, who doesn't? I thought that was a good rebuttal to the notion of like where I was saying there wasn't a lot of character development. To take them as a whole, an amalgam of a character, it was interesting in that you shifted my perspective. <laughs> um, I, I will say, honestly, like there, I, I, I almost, for in Station Eleven, it was like I, was so annoyed with Elizabeth. Like, there, I'm finding myself talking about the characters that kind of pissed me off. Oh, am I allowed to say that? Oh, gosh, of course I'm the one that gets bleeped on Canada Reads. <laughs> um, but I really liked Miranda. Uh, I, and I, I almost wish there had been more of her, that she wasn't sort of left all on her own out on this Malaysian beach in the end. Uh, although there was something sort of... Um, prophetic about that, I suppose, and, and, and poetic. Um, but I just felt that she had a real strength to her, that uh, the way that she just took fame and went, Ugh, and that she really, she was never woe is me. When she was in her 20s and had no money and had to do a job that she didn't really want and was trying to be an artist, and you know, sort of in contrast, for example, to here or even to Muna's experience, I just really liked that about her, that she was her own person and she was able to walk away from the machine of Arthur Leander and Hollywood and all of it. Um, I loved that she just, her art, she did it because she loved it. Well, what um, about Mona, actually? You you mentioned it just in passing uh, or, or quickly. What about Mona's character? Um, you know, this is a really, it's difficult to talk about as of somebody who obviously does not have an immigrant experience. But what I do have is a, my, my mother-in-law, of course, who moved here. And that really shifted my perspective as a, as having grown up like, what was me? I'm so hard done by because my, I, I grew up with a single mother who never had any money. And I was a latchkey kid I talked about. And I think for me, Hotline just hit too close to home. Uh, so I found Muna very sort of like, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and to some degree, rightly so. Um, so I just, it just was not a character that I liked being in. And I think it's just because it was too much for me to, to, I know what that's like. I know what it was like for my mom to, if we had hot dog day, to not be able to buy coffee at work. Sure. Um, and Tasneem, so that just was a lot of close to home. You had a similar but different perspective yesterday yeah. where you were like, I know it, but I know it so well that uh, you almost felt, I don't want to take your words out of your mouth, but yeah. you felt like you knew this story already. You know, my mom called me after I was talking about it. And I think this whole reading hotline was more like a mirror than transformative. And I don't think it needed to be. And I, hopefully we have time because I have a little story. But growing up, you know, I grew up with people who looked exactly like me. I never had to be like this other and I feel like that's why another reason that this book wasn't transformative for me. But then when I went to university and then I met people who did not know that, you know, black Muslim women could exist. And that notion just surprised me. And I feel like that kind of story can help people understand the immigrant experience, how hard it is to be, you know, single and the intersectionality of it all with Muna's character. So I don't know. I did have to take myself away from that. Like, yes, it didn't do much for me because this is a story that I know every single day. But... I'm thinking about the people who I went to university with, and I really want to give every single one of them because black Muslim people exist. The fact that she is a woman who speaks French and she's Syrian exists. And I think that kind of narrative is really important. Final words to you, Michael. What about Muna? Let's, uh, let's uh, focus on this character. Uh, there was a moment in, in Hotline that I'll never forget when she's uh, buying uh, warmer clothes for Omar and she's getting a, a jacket for herself and she rejects these sort of threadbare woolen ones and finally she finds something and she said um, that this particular garment had less weariness of all the women that had worn it before her. Um, that really struck me, you know. Um. That is it for this debate. I left you the last word and it was great. But <laughs> we do have to move on from that round. The next thing I'm gonna ask you, you know, these, the, the, the characters in these books find themselves in tough new realities. It 
sort of goes without saying if you've read these books. They're dealing with economic insecurity, misogyny, grief, racism, violence, devastating loss, pretty bleak stuff. And yet each book shows us the, what we would call the slim edge of hope. So let me ask you this, which book best portrays the power of hope to get you through hard times to sneak? You know, I think I kind of already alluded to Hotline doing that as well. But I think also with that, I, I, when I was reading it again, because I was saying yesterday that I really wish that that story had an extra layer of depth. And I was wondering why, right? And I was going through it again and I realized this is basically his love letter to his own mom, right? But I think with that, it was kind of disguised, it was a fiction book disguised as a memoir, if that makes sense. Maybe it was the opposite. Grammar's yeah. hitting me right now. But I think with that comes with limitations because it only really focused on Muna and not more than that. I loved Muna's, we didn't talk about this yesterday, but we didn't talk about Muna in relation to her clients. And I loved that so much and I loved being within that dialogue so much and I would have loved to see even that perspective of her client, especially the one who with the husband who was cheating on her, mm -hmm. to go see what her advice really helped with her with her clients as well and even with her son because she's more than just Muna. She has so many other things that project out of her and I really wish they could have expanded on that for that, I guess, elevated layer of hope for me. So but yeah. What's your reaction to that, Pratik? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your input. Um, yeah, I like the way uh, you said that um, uh, she is more than one person like um, uh, she's at, at home, she takes care of her son, at work. Uh, uh, she's not just a weight loss consultant. Uh, she's a counselor, she's a friend, she's a therapist. Uh, um, people are calling her the same way um, uh, we call to mental health professional for advice, for support. And, uh, and people find her voice so soothing. And on the, on the phone, they are revealing their personal life. We don't do this. We don't do it uh, um, uh, usually until we have a trust in someone. And, and she's doing despite her own struggles, like despite she's going through, and she's quickly moving on. I found it very beautiful that, uh, that uh, the pain she carries deeply in her, in her heart, and despite that, she's finding her way to move on. She's find a way to build hope, and because hope is very powerful. Hope is what keeps us uh, alive. Keep, keep, um, like if we go to the history of humanity, uh, we have seen wars, pandemics, floods, so many things, and what kept humanity alive, alive uh, is hope. So and this let me, on that note, uh, very powerful thing you're saying here, Gurdeep, let me ask you, Michael, what, uh, what book best portrays that, uh, the, the power of hope to get you through, um, well, through a tough time? You know, obviously, you know, from my opening statement, um, Station Eleven is, is written with hope as a destination. You know, these people, they walk and walk, and that's where they're going. That's ultimately where they're going. Um, uh, Hotline, to me, really spoke powerfully to hope as well. That, that Muna and her family, her, her son, they moved towards this place um, of recognizing uh, their space inside this, you know, alien country. Uh, that spoke powerfully to me. Uh, but Ducks, of course, is a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. um, I think about the last frame of, of that book, and I'm haunted by it. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's just, you know, those two women caught in that single frame. Um, I get less hope from Ducks mm -hmm. um, than the other books, and, and certainly Station Eleven. Uh, but I don't think that's exactly what Katie was, was trying to say. Mm -hmm. What she's trying to say is, like, this was an awakening for myself, mm -hmm. uh, for a community of people that don't know about um, this, this extractive industry mm -hmm. and how sexual violence scars one for life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. Like, I don't think the point of Ducks is to be hopeful, and I don't think that it should have to be a hopeful book, right? I think that there are a lot of other reasons that people want to experience literature, and I think that sometimes it is to, like, open up those hard conversations and expose those realities. 
I do think that for me, and maybe this is like the maritimer in me that loves a good bit of gallows humor, <laughs> the one thing that I really found funny was like the longer Katie works in the oil sands, she starts making fun of the safety training that you have to do every time after there's like a workplace accident. And that's a, like a means of coping. Kind of similarly to, I think like the characters in both of these other books have these ways that they cope with difficult reality. That's like the one thing that I found kind of hopeful and the, the solidarity between people that had all moved out to Fort Mac uh, from the same place, the support among, uh, you know, Cape Bretoners in that community. I want to talk a little bit about Hotline and the sort of story of hope there, because I think that Station Eleven and Hotline are both books that attempt to be hopeful, and so therefore we can kind of evaluate them both more on that basis. I don't know that I felt that hopeful at the end of reading Hotline, and the reason why is I think that Yes, we have this beautiful awakening of spring and Muna or Mona has moved into her new apartment. She's still in this job that is like way below what she's qualified to do. She has gotten a pay raise, but it's like, I kind of am like it's looking, it's, this is my thing is I'm like, okay, this seems like an unstable business model. The sort of ethics of selling people these like diet crash packages over the phone. It's not the point of the book to interrogate it, but it doesn't really interrogate it. You know, we have, we have the, the medical student at one point who says, you know, your son shouldn't be eating this. That's like probably why he's not in great health. And so to me, I kind of am like, okay, she's changed her name. This is a new beginning. It also sort of represents assimilation. I'm not sure that I feel that hopeful at the end of reading Hotline, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. That is it for this round. Before we get into the vote, I'm going to give you each a chance to respond to what was said today. You'll each get 30 seconds, uh, a final chance to persuade your fellow panelists. So, Mateo, we'll start with you again. One last chance to convince the panel to not vote against Ducks. I think that Ducks is a book that blasts open a reality that a lot of us don't see. I think a lot of us in Central and Western Canada do not see the reality of displacement and the generational history of that in the Maritimes. I think a lot of us all across the country do not see the brutal reality of what it is like to work in the oil sands, even for the people who are the most privileged in that environment. And I think that Ducks has also opened up the broader conversation about just how terrible and toxic these extractive industries are. I think there are so many ways in which this book can shift your perspective regardless of where you're actually coming from. And I beg you to keep it in the competition because I have so much more to say. Okay. Thank you, Matea. Gurdip, you're next. You have 30 seconds to convince your fellow panelists, panelists that Hotline should stay another day. We live in a polarized society. You may have social media friends from different backgrounds. Uh, you may say them hello wherever you meet. Uh, however, uh, you don't create deep level friendships or connections with them uh, the way you do with your, the people from your own backgrounds. So fears, assumptions, and racism continue to exist. Broaden your horizon, expand your worldview uh, the way Hotline's Mona does, and thus heal our country with an exemplary unity in diversity. Thank you, Gurdip. Michael, it is your turn to make one last argument for Station Eleven. 30 seconds are on the clock. Um, I'm glad Keegan talked about Miranda because uh, Miranda, of course, creates the Station Eleven comic. Uh, Station Eleven is a mechanism for her to archive and order the chaos of her world. And I think Station Eleven does, does this beautifully as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artwork itself. Um, it is a place where we transubstantiate loneliness and grief into something lasting. Thank you, Michael. Okay, panelists, that is it. It is time to vote. You have your ballots in front of you. As you have done the last two days, please mark an X beside the book you want to eliminate from the competition. Once you have voted, Bridget from the Canada, Canada Reads team will take your ballot. I'll remind you again, there are no secret ballots on Canada Reads. Our free agents taking a little bit more time with the vote than our panelists who are still in the running. Notice that. Are you, are you waiting on me? Which title will go today? Will it be Ducks by Kate Beaton? Matea Roach is championing that book. Will it be Hotline by Dimitri Nasrella? That novel was chosen by Gurdip Pandere. 
and will it be Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel? Michael Gray Eyes is backing that title. Whichever one it is, it will join Greenwood by Michael Christie and Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia on the shelf. I'll remember. Uh, I'll remind everyone that um, votes so far, Station Eleven has had one vote against it on day two. It was by Keegan. Ducks has had one vote against it also on day two that was by Tasneem. Hotline has had no votes against it so far. Sneaking under the radar for deep. We'll see if that continues to be the case. We have two free agents in Keegan and Tasneem. It's noteworthy that their votes were the one vote against Station uh, 11 and Station uh, and, and Ducks respectively. Who will go next? We are about to find out. I have the ballots. All right, Gurdip Pandeir, how did you vote? Uh, sometimes you have less options, but I voted again. The book I love is Ducks. Okay, that is one vote against Ducks. Matea Roach, how did you vote? Um, based on the arguments we heard today and also my initial experiences reading the other two books remaining in the competition, I voted against Hotline. We have one vote against Hotline and one, one against Ducks. Michael Gray Eyes, how did you vote? I voted against Ducks today. It's two votes against Ducks and one against Hotline. Now's our moment. Keegan, Connor, Tracy, <laughs> it is your moment. What, how did you vote? Uh, I think, you know, look, if this was the book I think all of Canada should read, I would say Station Eleven. But the, my mandate is the book to shift to perspective, and, and I don't feel like it does that, and I'm so sorry, but I voted for Station Eleven. We have one vote against Station Eleven. Two against Ducks, one against Hotline, one against Station Eleven. Tasneem Gidi, how did you vote? I don't like that it's on me, but I, I, I voted for Hotline. I'm so sorry. All right. Two votes against Hotline, two against Ducks. We have a tie. What does that mean? Let's turn to the Canada Reads rule books. We have a tie. The panelists who did not vote against either of the books up for elimination must break the tie. This is the case even if that panelist is defending one of the two books up for elimination. Keegan Connor Tracy, you voted against Station Eleven, which was not one of the two books in the tie. Oh, crap. You are now entrusted with breaking this tie between Ducks and Hotline. Which book will go? We have a very rapidly advancing clock. Um, this time then I'm just gonna vote with my heart. The, the, the book I liked the least was Hotline and I will vote Hotline. And with that, Hotline is eliminated. We have under two minutes. I wanna get your feelings, Gurdip, if you can sum them up in a short period of time. I would say that I'm honored to be here, that uh, I got uh, this opportunity to champion this book, and uh, I, I got this uh, opportunity to tell the story of Muna to, ca to Canadians. I hope that uh, some of them are able to learn from it, and uh, uh, learning is the only way to grow. Yeah, you can uh, you know, remind people why they should read Hotline if you have another um, so is another comment to make about that? Um, I think uh, uh, this book digs deeper into many, many things. Uh, um, it digs about uh, uh, judgments, uh, racism, and other things. Uh, we usually brush aside those things. Uh, the reason is that we don't experience them. It's a similar thing. Once we, we don't experience it, we don't, uh, we, we don't, uh, we don't know. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, Gurdip. You, uh, you came to the table with the, the on-brand joy and positivity <laughs> and, and lent that to this book. And I think um, readers and, 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 and the author, Dimitri Nasrella, will, will have benefited from that. Um, but that is a goodbye to Hotline. We have two books left. Ducks by Kate Beaton, championed by Matea Roach, and Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, chosen by Michael Gray Eyes, and then there were two. I'm your host, Ali Hassan. Tomorrow, we find out the one book all of Canada should read. And I thought it was you. So That's was like, no, another like, no, debate in the books. <laughs> A lot to unpack today. 
Um, you know, uh, the, the theme was a book to shift your perspective. Let me, let me ask you, Michael Graves, let me start with you. Did, uh, did Hotline shift your perspective? It really, really did. It truly did. Um, you know, apart from my own, you know, choice, um, I was most affected by Hotline. Uh, you know, I'm not an immigrant. Um, but when I came from Western Canada to Toronto, um, I felt that isolation, you know, as a, as a, as a Westerner in the East. And uh, I time traveled in a way that I, I haven't time traveled uh, with a book. Um, I felt like I could see like the brown bricks. I could, I could see the dark, dirty snow of Montreal. Um, I, I was profoundly um, affected by Muna's story. Uh, I'm glad Keegan talked about the fact that, you know, unlike other people who, you know, experience isolation, you know, as, as Katie did when she went west, um, Muna's, a, you know, coming out of a war. Like, this is a person who is traumatized by life experience. And when she comes here, just that bravery, um, the, the, the quiet strength of her is something I'll never forget. Mateo, what did you enjoy most about Hotline? I loved, I loved the time. The time travel, the evocation of Montreal as a specific setting, the fact that there was such particularity of like the area in town that she lives, where she goes to work, like all of those things were incredibly easy to visualize. And I think that this is a story that like, even if you, you know, don't have, you know, obviously I think it was mentioned the other day, Gurdip, if you're not indigenous, at some point, someone in your family was an immigrant to Canada. Even if you're someone where that immigration story isn't within living memory, odds are you know people where this is their story. Like, I think about everyone that I went to university with and most of the people that I'm close with from U of T are people who either are immigrants or their parents were immigrants. And so the sort of direct connection to like, oh my God, this is what so many people I know have gone through or their families have gone through was really incredible. So I'm so glad that we got to read this book together. I'm like also really interested to see what else Dimitri has written. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another feature of this is like, I wanna read all the other books by these authors. Yeah. It's an interesting, I'm a Montrealer until mm -hmm. I was in my thirties and it is through all the hardship and all the struggle, it is still a love letter to Montreal mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. an interesting way, this book. Tasneem, I, I thought you were to, gonna oh, say, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, Tasneem, did, did you get scolded by your mother yesterday? You said your mother no, called you? No, she's or? like, oh my God, I'm so proud. You know, you talked about me and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just liked the shout out. But genuinely, like what I was talking about with my university experience, I really think this is a really good gateway for people to, because ignorance and hatred, it, you're not born into it. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you learn it, you're t and it, it also made me kind of, sympathize, not sympathize, but feel bad for some of my colleagues who didn't understand the immigrant experience. And I'm so glad that books like this can exist so that they can learn and understand and really grow. So I am sad to see you go and I really hope that everybody does read it because it's so important. Keegan. Yeah, I mean, I know. I, <clears throat> so <laughs> it makes me really think about my mother-in-law who came from the Philippines and I didn't mean to get emotional, but I feel bad to like set this book aside in light of that. But I, I really feel like, um, you know, she came in the 60s to a small town in Ontario when the immigrant experience was like, really, you were different. She was just lucky enough that she came with a, a sort of like, we called them a whole plane load of Filipina nurses that came um, during the nursing shortage at that time. Um, and so she had a sense of community that I think um, buffered her to some degree. But I, I really feel like I know that she got treated differently. I know that there was racism against her. And if people just understood what immigrants give up to come to this country, where we are so lucky to live. And so I'm really sorry that I, that that's the one I cast away. I like, it was really hard to do. And just in that moment, I was like, well, that's the one that hurt. So I put it aside, I guess. It's an unenviable position that we put you in. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. It's like A or B mm -hmm. and time is ticking. And as you can see, it really is. We're not sort of making that up, sorry. right? No, no, no. The actress got all emotional. <laughs> I didn't mean to do you that, but the really. the first one to cry today, it's okay. <laughs> I know, and but I, I, I think wanna... Lolita is listening yeah. and I love you and I, I hope you are still listening. Yeah. And I would like to say that this is just a window, like showing immigration experience through this work. Uh, it's just window to show many other experiences. Um, I purposefully didn't want to focus only on immigration experience. I just wanted to use as a, as a door to enter and uh, learn about biases, stereotypes 
about all kinds of people who look different, who have different life choices, who are born differently but choose their life differently. So it's like broadening your horizon about everyone. Mm -hmm. Gurdeep, thank you very much for that. That is a wrap on Canada Reads today. My thanks to our panelists, Matea Roach, Gurdeep Pandeir, Keegan Connor Tracy, Tasneem Gidi, and Michael Greyeyes. They'll all be back tomorrow for the grand finale. We will see you then. I'm Ali Hassan. Until then, read on, Canada. <laughs>